What's it like to be a Christian and play in the NFL? Well, this week we're going to find out in this week's TGI at Work podcast. How do I bring my faith to work? How do I tap into the power of God in my work life call? Why am I going through this adversity? Is God mad at me? I'm Oz Hillman, and I've been helping leaders like you answer these questions and more for over 30 years. And that's what this podcast is all about. Let's learn and grow together. Welcome to TGIF Today, God is First. Well, welcome everybody to this week's TGI Fit Work podcast. It's great to be with you, and uh, it's great to have a special guest, Brian Schwartz, that I have just recently gotten to know, and I've visited with him down in his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida. And he and I and a few other brothers are launching into some exciting times where we're building the kingdom in Jacksonville and other places and just uh, all sorts of things. You're going to be hearing some of that today and uh, hearing from Brian's story. So, Brian, welcome to our program this week. (laughs) Well, Oz, thanks for thanks for having me, man. It's been a privilege um, getting to know you and and the folks you are running with, and um, yeah, we're in exciting times. And I appreciate the opportunity just to spend some time with you and everyone that's watching and listening. And um, man, it's just uh, one of those seasons we're in that there's such expectancy, you know. And and anytime we can spread that good news, I think it's really really powerful. Well, if you're looking, uh, if, you're, if you're accessing it by video, you can tell Brian's a big muscular guy, and that's because he was a linebacker uh, for Jacksonville for uh, five years, right? Yep. And uh, now today uh, he's been uh, on staff with the local church at some point. He's a business coach. He operates in the gifts to minister to business men and women in the marketplace. And now he's uh, partnering with us on some initiatives with marketplace leaders. And um, so we're going to get into Brian's story and just hear how God's used him. Um, You know, the NFL is uh, an interesting place to live out your life. And I'll bet you've got some great stories and we want to, we want to go back to some of your history and uh, where did you go to college? I grew up in South Dakota, so I grew up grew up in the cold uh, most wow. of the season, right there in the plains on a dairy farm. And so, wow. my my thought was, I'm going to escape escape uh, the route of farming, and uh, I threw myself into athletics. It became not just an escape, but a place of refuge for me, honestly. And and ended up going to college at Augustana University, right there in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Oh, and uh, yeah, so somehow. Uh, looking back at that time, I wasn't serving the Lord at all, but somehow the Lord plucked me out of there and, and found me and, uh, Jacksonville called and drafted me in 1995. And man, that was the turning point really of a lot of different, um, different things in my own life. It was, it's been quite a journey, but that's where I went to college. It was a D2 school. And so the odds of making it are, are hard enough but uh, man, getting found and plucked out of there by Tom Coughlin and the Jaguars was a real privilege. Wow. Now, were you a believer at that time? I was not. No, I was I was not brought up really. You know, we'd maybe stumble into church, a Methodist church locally, some Christmas, some Easter. I, I even did some confirmation classes. I remember I faked my way through that and and I remember we finished those confirmation classes and the pastor was talking to a young lady who had gone before me. I listened in on their conversation and basically just copied what she said. So I, I kind of faked my way through it spiritually and ended up going to Augustana, which is has some Lutheran roots. And so we would take some Bible courses, but as far as a relationship, really a hunger and thirst for God, I didn't have that. I was pretty broken at the time and and had some abusive things that have happened in my past. And so my my outlet, my refuge really was football, was sports. So, um, you know, I imagine people out there just wonder, what is it really like to play professional football? What were some highlights and uppers and downers that you experienced in that career? Well, one of the biggest highlights uh, for me was 
draft day. Honestly, it was like, you know, I'm moving from this place of being a hopeful to now having somebody call you on the phone back then in the 1900s, you know, phones were still attached to the wall. Loss, so, <laughs> you know, I had to stick around and wait that whole day. But when they called my name, it, it, it really, it transformed me almost instantaneously. It opened up this door of possibility and that world. And when you look at the NFL world, it is, it is everything as a football player you're aiming for, but you want to talk about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know, I got thrown right into that as a young man, uh, newly married, uh, didn't know the Lord. And I was really struggling, to be honest with you, with the, the the power dynamics. I had everything you could ever want. I had money. I had power. I had prestige in our community. The team was a brand new team. So the city of Jacksonville was just on fire for uh, our football team. You know, the highlights, obviously, are those years we made at the AFC Championship game. I played in an era of football where I got to play against John Elway, Barry Sanders, Jerome Bettis. I mean, uh, Brett Favre. You know, the players during that era were really, really phenomenal players. And I was very fortunate to be uh, chosen during that time. And then just the camaraderie, man, that's that's still something I miss at times. You know, that locker room was just a melting pot of so many different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different ages, different backgrounds. And so that was the real highlight. And then, you know, the lowlights are, you know, you realize how empty it is. Uh, you realize um, – your your name is gone very quickly when you're not useful anymore when you're not needed anymore you know you're you're disposed of pretty quickly and you know an injury pops up i battled through some injuries those are the painful moments it, and you really had to learn how to partner with pain uh, i remember two years when i was done playing i woke up one day kind of like this i was like oh man i actually feel good physically it took about two years to get my body back into alignment and, you know, you don't really know what you're under until you're not under it. So, you know, those are some of the highs and lows. But at the end of the day, the biggest high was in 96, uh, the off season. I went through my rookie season, Oz, and I had a great year. I was a middle linebacker. I started for us as a rookie. Every time I was healthy, I was a starter. I had favor with the coaching staff. Uh, after my rookie season, though, I came to this point of of just um, disillusionment. I, I had, I'd had a great season. Um, we're in the off season now expecting our first baby. Um, it, it, and so I was kind of spiraling. I had a lot of insecurity, a lot of self-destructive tendencies, terrified about being a dad. And I, I was already being a poor husband. And uh, my wife and I ended up at a Bible study at Mark Brunell's house, our quarterback. So the biggest highlight of my whole NFL career was ending up, you know, at my, my buddy's house, our quarterback. Uh, Mark was a man of God. I didn't really understand what that was. Uh, I just thought he had really weird taste in music to be straight up with you. And, uh, but he was, he was authentic, lived in my same world. Long story short, we encountered Christ that night, my both, my wife and I both, and we both got radically saved along with five of our teammates and their wives and girlfriends. So oh. kind of started a move of God down here um, in, in our football team and a little bit in Jacksonville. Now you were, uh, that was year number what? That was my, that was off season after my rookie year. So that was 1996 you know, going into my second year in the league. Wow. So you actually were a Christian during some of your career and, uh, how did, how did that work out? Well, the good news is, um, the guys I ran and partied with, um, were pretty good players on the team as well. And we all got saved the same night. So, so oh, we wow. all got born again the same night. Wow. And Get so a, it was a really an cool army thing. already. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. So it was so, we were so fortunate. Um, some of us had different backgrounds. Some had Catholic backgrounds. Some were like me that really didn't have a background. But one thing we had in common is that we now had come to, to fall in love with Jesus. And to, to we wanted to grow and learn who the father was and, we were part of a ministry that did a great job of, of pouring foundational truths into us at a, at a good pace. Uh, some of us didn't have a lot to unlearn. And so we were just hungry and thirsty. And so we had a real advantage on the team. It's one thing to be a Christian. It's another thing to be a good player and a Christian. And so uh, because some of our best players on the team, uh, we're also men of God. We didn't have anything figured out, but we were committed to growing and developing. That was, I think, really attractive to our teammates because we weren't putting on a facade that we 
we we weren't most of us weren't churched and so we were in a locker room and we got reached in a bible study in a living room and so the message we brought was really the message of hope and restoration and so on that front it was it was great now of course you're going to have the guys that mock you you're going to have the guys that ridicule you but ironically a lot of those guys when they were struggling in their lives it, it's kind of like nicodemus came at night to visit jesus a lot of those guys would come kind of secretly and go, I need help with my marriage, or I need help with my life right now. And so a lot of our work was done in some of those moments, honestly, yeah. of just being good teammates, high performers on the field. Um, you know, I didn't have the issue with violence. You know, some people ask, well, how'd you deal with the violence? I was like, listen, this is my job, you know, and, and we're called everything we put our hand to, we're supposed to do with all of our might. Uh, we felt like one of our, our callings was to go out on that field uh, be the greatest competitors we could be if we have to be violent because it's a violent sport. So be it. We don't need to talk trash. We don't, we can still glorify God um, even in the fight by how we do it. And that's kind of how we approached it. Now I understand you won uh, something called the Dick Butkus award. Is that right? Well, I was nominated, so nominated. I didn't win it, Okay, but I was the first division two player to ever be nominated for it. There's subsequent have been other guys from division two, but I was the first division two guy to be nominated for that, that linebacker award, the Dick Buckus award. And awesome. he passed away this year. Yeah. It's, it was sad to see him pass away, but man, what a great player he was. So yeah, that was, that was a cool thing as a division two player. Yeah. We, um, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank, but the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons for years, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank of his name, but he was a member of our golf club and we often played okay. golf with him. But, um, anyway, that's a that's a, a interesting. I know many of our uh NFL fans out there would find find uh, your journey of particular interest. I want to shift now and just talk about your life after football. And you know, you uh, you've been uh, really serving. Uh, in leadership in a lot of different areas with the local church and now as a business coach. And um, how did that transition go for you? Yeah. When my football career was, was drying up, it was my fifth year. Um, I played five years. I was heading into free agency. I had one workout out on the West coast with the 49ers I thought I was going to sign with them. It didn't happen. And I prayerfully considered it. I just felt like when I stepped into that locker room for the last time, it was like the Holy Spirit just whispered to me and said, okay, take a good look around, take a good whiff. You know, locker rooms have a certain smell and uh, you're, you're done. And so it was really hard because, you know, that's a part of your identity. You don't realize how much it is until you're not doing it. And so yeah, five years, um, not that long. Yeah. Yeah. So, I transitioned from there. I had a, we we had through that time period, we had actually helped start and plant a church here in Jacksonville called South Point Community Church. Great pastor named Russ Austin, and so Russ had this awesome gift. He was tr he was truly a pastor. Pastor. He had a pastoral gift. He was a shepherd, and he helped us tremendously. And so during that transition, he brought me on staff as kind of just a layperson on staff. And he gave me a little office there. He knew I needed something to put my hands to. And so he assigned me to the men. He assigned me to the men's group and helping with that. And uh, even at an early uh, start of my walk, uh, God had given me certain gifts. And he saw that. He was, he was uh, a great leader in the sense that he could spot gifts in people. And one of those gifts was the prophetic. I know we're going to talk about that. But then also... Uh, kind of the discerning of spirits. And and so part of even when I was playing, I would pray for a lot of different people for them to get set free of different bondages and, and the Holy Spirit would just do amazing things. And so that was kind of the natural progression into ministry. Um, he would allow me to meet with different individuals, to pray with them, to stand in the gap with them, uh, also in, it, exhort and encourage men. Um, he allowed me to step out. Honestly, it's kind of like coach Coughlin. He threw me right into the fire. 
Well, Russ Austin did the same thing. And our ministry at large did the same thing. They threw us kind of into the fire. So get out there, step out, share your story, share your testimony. Uh, and then, of course, through the time of development and growth, I'm learning how to communicate the gospel of the kingdom. Um, and then just just one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of the fruit in my life was one-on-one -on -one with different people. You know, sometimes God would just show me different things about individuals and um, because of my background, I think there was kind of that immediate trust, especially with like high level leaders and business people. And so fast forward, we ended up getting sent out from our church, went to Austin, Texas to help a church there. I came on staff as a pastor, also a traveling kind of evangelist to different NFL teams that we had had some uh, impact with. And then I went out and planted churches in Colorado. Uh, we were out in Colorado for about 11 years. And we planted, uh, I think by the end of it, there were three different churches that came of, out of our church um, and, and they would grow to a certain point and we just knew it, it was time to expand. And so we hit these different points of growth and it was a lot of fun and a lot of challenge and uh, just felt the tug in 2015 to transition from pastoring and uh, decided to move back here to Jacksonville. Didn't understand fully why. Um, but every time we'd get the map out and I was thinking about moving to, to South Carolina or Texas, we'd always go, how far is it from Jacksonville? There was always something pulling us back to Jacksonville. And so we moved back in 2015, reconnected with a lot of our friends and, and, and just, we call them family here. This is where we got our start spiritually. And then, uh, transition after that, I was still doing a lot of traveling, speaking, uh, but again, I look back on my life, like I was, these last two years going, where's the highest level of impact? It's been with what I would term high capacity leaders um, who have unique careers that are under a lot of pressure and who need help uh, learning how to become vulnerable. We're mm -hmm. not very good at that. And so helping them grow in their vulnerability, but also their awareness, um, both of, of where they may be not, but also where they are. And helping them bridge that gap and, of course, bringing the kingdom of God in and through that. And so even when I'm working with business um, individuals, it's more along the lines of life development. My whole thing is like if I can help them with their mindset, if they can develop that skill set of having that healthy mindset, especially a kingdom mindset, man, then they can be a real asset in everything they do at home, at work, wherever that is. So that's a lot of what I, I do now is helping them right-size God and resize problems and reframe suffering. Uh, do you have any connection to the team today? I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good friends with the chaplain. And so there are times that I'll, I'll go down there and, and serve. And then as a former player, uh, they do a good job of including us on Sundays. There's different times we can go down there. Uh, we can sign autographs. We go visit suites. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're part of that group trying to help, you know, just help keep the fan base uh, right. on target because uh, we're rebounding. You had a tough game, tough game Monday night last night, but, but uh, the team is rebounding. And so it's an exciting time here in Jacksonville for football anyway. Awesome. Awesome. So, in Acts chapter 5, it says the apostles did many miraculous signs in the public colonnade where the people could see them. And, and you know, Jesus and the apostles, they didn't do a lot of miracles in the, in the church or the synagogue. And it was all in the public square. And one of the things I find that's a great weakness with many marketplace leaders is they they get saved, but they never move on into the miracle side of Christianity where they're experiencing the power of God in a very tangible way. And uh, you and I have talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the, in particular prophecy and words of knowledge and how powerful that can be. In fact, Ephesians 2.20 says that the church was established on the apostles and the prophets. How did the, how did the whole uh, area of you discovering that you had some gifting in the area of prophecy? And just let me define for our listeners 
you know, prophecy, you know, Bible says that we all prophesy, but there are also gifts. There is a gift of prophecy and uh, there's a gift of words of knowledge and there's, there's the office of prophet. And so, um, you know, many of us uh, have the ability or all of us have the ability to prophesy, but we may not have the gift. Now, how did that come about for you? How did you first discover that you had some gifting in that area? And how does that played out in your walk today? Yeah, my first uncovering of that, um, you know, Peter says everything needed for life and godliness is already in us through the Holy Spirit and our knowledge of Jesus. And so as a young Christian, three weeks old in the Lord, uh, we'd had our baby two days after we got saved. My wife and I had our first baby. And three weeks later, against doctor's orders, we went, got on a plane to Austin, Texas, and we showed up at this athletic conference and we come into the meeting and we have no grid for this. And there's, there's really great worship going on. Now I didn't think it was so great at the time. I thought it was a little bit strange. I just didn't have a grid. And so people are lifting their hands. And so we walked into an environment where the power of God was present. Now, initially it wasn't, it wasn't that it wasn't attractive. We just didn't understand it. And so by the end of that first night, there was a gentleman there and his name's Jim LaFoon. He, he walks in the office of a prophet. When you talk about an office, he serves the church at large as a true prophetic voice. And I didn't know him from anybody, but he, he, he looks at us in the back row and says, you guys come up here. And so my wife, Diane and I, with a new baby, we go up to this guy in front of some of my teammates and all these different athletes. We had NBA guys there, hockey guys there, NFL guys there. And this is our first time. And so he begins to pray over us. He said, can I pray for you? He had this little raspy voice and, and these eyes that it looked like he was looking right through me and he wasn't being mystical. He was just being who he is. And he began to uh, call out things in Diana and I, and even our, our new baby, things that have come to pass since he began to talk about even back then a unique church planting gift um, he talked about some of my past. He saw some things in my past that need to be prayed over. He saw things in Diane, the type of mom she, uh, wife she is, the mom she was going to be. So that was my first experience with a true, authentic, prophetic word. And it happened to be with my friends and with my fellow colleagues, so to speak, in the career I was in. So it was it was not done in the church it was done in a time when we just were gathering together to get just to get inspired and, and gain hope. And so fast forward, ended up getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I, I don't I don't know what, if you want to talk about that at all. But basically what I what I mean by that is that they were doing a teaching. Uh, they walked through the book of Acts. They walked through Jesus words that he would baptize with with power and fire. And they basically said, if you want this, come up and get prayer. Now, again, I didn't know scripture. All I was like, okay, I, I got water baptized. I got born again. And now this guy's telling me I could also have power, that I could have the power to overcome sin, that I could have the power to reach out and help other people. Like the way he packaged it was like, okay. And since then I now go, okay, the Holy Spirit's in me for me, but the Holy Spirit can also come on us for others. Mm -hmm. And so when I went up and got prayer, I just, I felt his power and, and that was my first encounter really with his power. The night I got saved, I encountered his love and his peace, but that night I encountered his power on the plane ride back. It was as if something got activated that, uh, during that conference, cause on the plane ride back, I started getting words of knowledge. I didn't know the words for it. I didn't have the terminology, the steward, the, the lady that was on the plane helping as the stewardess, I just started seeing something about her daughter. And I, I just, I said, ma'am, you may think I'm crazy, but I feel like God just wants you to know your daughter's going to be fine. Like, and, and, and man, she's broke down in tears. And so that was kind of my first encounter without having any terminology. It's what you said. We all can prophesy. We all can get words of knowledge. We all can get words of wisdom. That's different than the office, but when the need of the moment calls for it, that's why I think Paul's talking about first Corinthians 12, right? He's like, when the need of the moment calls for a move of God's spirit, if you're available, 
if you make yourself available and you're open to him moving in your life and you're willing to step out. Um, I didn't have any bad training or bad experiences. I just had a great experience. And so I was like, okay, if he's going to show this to me, the least I could do is tell this young lady, Hey, your daughter's going to be fine. And so yeah. that's kind of how it started. And that's really how I approach it now. Yeah. I don't overcomplify it. Don't over spiritualize it. Don't Christianize it. Uh, just because the gift of prophecy, Oz, is you see it, Paul wrote in first Corinthians 14, three, it's for edification, encouragement, and comfort. And I think that's the heart of the father. That's right. And, you know, um, I find this is where, where the line is often with believers, especially in the marketplace that they're not available. I have a intercessor friend uh, say sometimes it's not about ability. It's about availability. Yeah. And, um, I first had an prophetic encounter, uh, probably around 2000 and, uh, it was life transformation. Uh, this particular man, I, I came from a Baptist background that didn't really teach much on this. And, and I sat down in this chair and this man begins to prophesy over me and says, I have a, a daughter and, and she's this and she's that and she's this and she's going to do that. And here's what's going to happen. And well, all of that seemed about a million miles away, but with literally within uh, a few months, everything he said came true. He, her life was transformed. My life was transformed. That man began to travel with me all over the world. And what we realized was we were fulfilling Ephesians 2.20, the apostles, yes. the prophets, uh, and uh, to establish the church. And, you know, I would, I have an apostolic teaching gift. And so when I would partner with him, we were a great dynamic duo, if you will, in the kingdom, because uh, then he would break up the fallow ground. You know, the prophetic gifts has the ability to break uh, the religious spirit, the the nominal Christian, and just break open into a whole new dimension in a person's life. And that's why it's an exciting gift to be around, because you you see the power of God released in such creative and fun ways. It, uh, I have a friend that we say it's like sitting in Santa Claus's lap, you know, when, when that gift is operating, cause you see the love of God, you know, we, uh, we did uh, some ministry in Hollywood and we, we, one of the people we ministered to was the head of the Hollywood prayer network. And she was a good Presbyterian and, um, and we had several leaders there at this particular meeting. And uh, I said, I want you to get prayed for by a friend of mine. And I said, he's right over there. Just go over there and, and uh, let him pray for you. And so he did. And about 30 minutes later, she comes back over to me and she's got tears flowing down her face uncontrollably. She said, I never knew there were people like that in the world. <laughs> he told me yes. that. Nobody knows about me and says, I want every person in Hollywood I know to experience that. And so she brought us back for the next five years and two wow. or three times a year, she'd sit us in a room and bring in entertainment people and God just uh, transformed their lives. And it was a really a glorious time. So That's amazing. You know, it's, no, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's a fun well, and it, I love how you guys, and, and I think, I think the key there too, is you walked in alignment, you know, you walked in order and you didn't bring, you didn't bring dysfunction. You brought order into dysfunction and chaos. And that's many times what the prophetic does, especially if it's combined with that apostolic um, mindset and undergirding it, it's kind of that, that stabilizes things. And then when the prophetic's allowed to be utilized in a very, transformative way that represents the father. Well, my whole thing with all these gifts is I just don't want to misrepresent the father. You know, I want to represent his heart for people. And and I think when you look at Jesus, you, you, you hear what he said, his mission was to put a face to the name of the father. It was to represent the father accurately in a time when he wasn't being represented well. And moments like that, that you just described, those are so powerful because it it really helps people go, man, he loves me. 
He doesn't just love me. He knows me. That he knows, that, knows me. That is a key thing that people realize for the very first time that the father knows them and loves them unconditionally, you know, yeah. uh, and it can literally save your life. One of the people that we prayed for was a Hollywood producer. We didn't know it. Uh, he comes into the room. He's very solemn. He's not saying anything. And my friend begins to prophesy into his life and says, I, I see what you're about to do. I see uh, uh, you're about to commit suicide. And, and uh, I see that your wife has done this and I see what's happened to your business. Well, this particular man we found out later was a producer of pursuit of happiness with Will Smith. And it was a movie about a man down on his mm -hmm. luck and just living off the street. Well, he was literally living his own story in a movie that he produced. And um, he, he never gave us any indication that what we were saying was accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. He left the room that day, and then at, at lunchtime, um, our host comes in and says, you're never going to guess what happened. You, you're just not going to believe this. You saved that man's life. He was going to commit suicide today. And uh, it was a wow. believable thing. So you just never know how God can use you. And I, I just want to encourage all of you who are listening or watching that. God has a, a, a bigger plan for you to use you in more significant ways. And, and when we talk about the Holy Spirit, you just need to invite the Holy Spirit into your life and ask him to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, let him guide you from there. And, um, you know, just be available during the day when, you know, sometimes you might be pumping gas and there's somebody across the, you might have a prompting to go over and say something. One time I was at a gas station and I felt prompted. That I heard this woman complaining about something. I went over and I said, can I pray for you? And she was shocked that I would pray for her in public. But, you know, offering to pray for somebody is a very disalarming thing for most people because most people are willing to let you pray for them. But um, yeah. to be available and be obedient is uh, the key thing. I want to transition in our final, final moments together and just talk about what do you see and take place in the Jacksonville area? And uh, what do you, what do you hope for in the Jacksonville area spiritually? Yeah. You know, Jacksonville has had several prophetic words uh, spoken over, you know, this area, the Northeast corner here of, of Florida of course, we've got some of that. And then, of course, on the first coast, um, the French Huguenots, their blood was shed. There was martyrdom that took place first first moments, uh, even before our country was a country. And so there's history there. There's there's shed blood. But but what I'm seeing in Jacksonville, I think I started figuring this out, why God had us move back is there's so much seed that has been sown in different areas and regions of the country or the world. And, and we're starting to see what I'm seeing here is more hunger, more thirst. I think anytime there's a move of God's spirit that's taking place, it starts with the bride itself getting reawakened to her first love. And we're seeing some places, some hot spots around our community where the churches themselves are starting to grow hungry and thirsty again to getting back to that first love. They're they're tired of church as usual. Um, they they want more, and I think that's that's what I feel in my spirit is, and I have it in my own heart. Is we know there's something more. We know there's something available, and so I I still feel like we're in that season. The last several years have been what Hebrews twelve talks about. We're we're in the season where anything that can be shaken is being shaken um, with the divine intent, the kingdom intent. Uh, the Lord's intention is not to shake people up, to rattle them, but to shake us up, to bring to the surface, the things that are manufactured, the things that have been man-made. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He used the example when, when Moses, when, when the, you know, he was on the mountain and the voice of God shook things that shook the earth. 
And in that group of people, it caused fear and trepidation where they withdrew. In this hour, I believe God is shaking things to reveal what's real and what's not, not to cause fear, but to cause people to be awakened to what they carry. What they actually carry on the inside of them is so powerful, but he's also got to deal with those manufactured things. And so, you know, these, these last few years have been incredible years of testing for the church, for people at large. And I, 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 this isn't a popular word, but I think the Lord is trying to teach us how to, how to get ready for more shaking and suffering and how to do that with promise, how to do that with anticipation, because we're going through things that are causing us to have to um, grow in our capacity to carry the ability to help people. Uh, the needs right now are so massive. And quite frankly, the church itself has to be reawakened uh, to her first love of Jesus so she can get ready to help these individuals that are going to be coming in at a whole other level. And it's happening already. The move of God is not just, it's it's been going on for thousands of years. We just happen to be in a season of human history where there's a lot of intensity. So I feel like the intensity is creating hunger and thirst, but then also shaking things that need to be shaking. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says, so that what remains is the eternal. These last few years, you've seen kind of who's the true church, who's the who's not who's still trying to figure it out. And, and you're seeing who's it's a season of prep. It's the season of preparation. I, I don't know how mm -hmm. I can say it any differently. It's like getting us ready. Yeah. So you are part of a leadership team that we have formulated uh, with marketplace leaders as a relaunch of marketplace leaders and TGIF. And we are beginning to establish local, um, uh, chapters, I guess, uh, regional areas of marketplace leaders, and Jacksonville is one of those areas. And if you're watching this and that sounds of interest to you, please uh, just contact me. I'll put my uh, my uh, 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 email is on the screen here, and uh, let us know because we're going to almost like franchises in cities because we we know we have to live all this stuff out on a a localized basis, uh, you know, walking together. And uh, Brian and several others are there in Jacksonville doing this. Before I forget, Brian, would you give out your website, how people might connect with you? Yeah, they can go to Brian, B-R-Y-A-N-L, the letter L, Schwartz.com. So Brian L, Schwartz.com. Best, probably quickest way would be through LinkedIn. Just hunt me down on LinkedIn as well. And I would just message me and we can connect. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me right now. Yeah. And if you live in another city and you say that sounds interesting, maybe I could uh, be uh, uh, a point person in my community. Just uh, let me know. Uh, just send an email to me at my address. And uh, well, Brian, thanks for being with us tonight. I wonder if you could offer a prayer to those in the marketplace that uh, we could uh, really be the uh, salt and light we need to be in this season. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just echo what you said, and then we'll pray. It, it's, it's, it's awareness of and, and availability. And then just, just take those little steps of stepping out, just those steps of courage. The, the, the men and women I'm working with, Oz, they, they don't realize how much they carry and what they can contribute. And they don't have to be spooky or overly spiritual. They just got to be them and let the anointing of God come. And so, Father, we just come into agreement with those that are watching this, listening to this. We're agreeing that this would be an incredible season of, of growing awareness of, of what they carry, the giftings they carry, the anointing uh, that they, they carry that thing that comes up on them uh, when they're the freest to do what they're, they, they know they're called to do. And then also a growing increase of availability, just in that, that conscientious availability that just giving you our, yes, I pray for that, for all of us, that we would grow and develop in that. And then, and then Lord, would you give us the courage 
just like you spoke to Joshua as he was leading a people uh, uh, and he was handed the baton and, and you spoke to him and said, be strong and very courageous to just obey. And Lord, would you give us the courage just to step out, obey, just to honor you through our obedience. You're not looking for perfection. You're not looking for any of that, but Lord, I believe this is the hour you want to pour out your anointing. Um, you're looking for men and women who will stand in the gap, who will help build the wall. And you've done that all throughout history. And we just agree, just like the prophet declared uh, when, when you were asking, who are we going to send? Um, Lord, we just say, hey, send us, Lord. Here we are. We don't have it all figured out, but we're available. And we just ask for that in Jesus' name, for your anointing and your presence like never before. Amen. 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 That was awesome. Uh, I just realized I uh, told people to reach out to me with the uh, name on the screen for those audio that won't help you much. So just contact me at OS at marketplaceleaders.org. That's OS at marketplaceleaders.org. Well, thanks, Brian. And uh, we'll be seeing you in Jacksonville before too long. <laughs> yes, sir. Good to see you. All, All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Let's face it. We all want to make a difference. We want to live for Christ. We want our work to have meaning deep down. We all want to live a larger story to make a difference in the world. But how do we do this? It doesn't just happen. We must invest in our spiritual and professional life that involves spiritual mentoring and training. But where do we go to get that kind of spiritual mentoring and professional training? Is it at church, a conference, a school? The Change Agent Master Mentor Program is the answer to that question, founded by Oss Hillman. He is a pioneer in marketplace ministry and has had a 40-year advertising and business career, working with clients like American Express, Steinway Pianos, Thomas Nelson Publishers, and a host of other successful companies. He understands the challenge of living for Christ in a pressure-packed business environment. He created the Change Agent Master Mentor Program to help leaders. Us will help you realize your dream of being successful in your career and having an influence on your world. The Change Agent Master Mentor Program is designed for you to realize your larger story, to understand your purpose, to learn and apply your faith life to your work life from us and other proven workspace leaders who are doing it. Our online course in group mentoring will help you become God's change agent, to be a cultural influencer and succeed in your work life call and grow in your relationship with God and with other members of the Change Agent Master Mentor Program. Come join us. Let's influence the world together. www.camastermentor.com